All right, hello everyone. Welcome to the breakout session from Amazon Managed Blockchain. In this session, we will share some customer success stories building private blockchain solutions that can support enterprise-grade workloads, which is always a challenge. Uh, my name is John Liu. I'm the head of product for AWS Web3 and Blockchain Services, and I've been leading product strategy in the blockchain industry for about five years now. And prior to that, I spent 18 years in traditional finance as a bond and credit default swap portfolio manager, and also as a product executive. So I've seen both sides of the industry. In this session, we will review why private blockchain is needed, how it can be used, and how it can be used specifically to enable more efficient multi-party workflows with enterprises that have to operate under regulatory and compliance requirements. Then we will share two success stories from our customers. I will share Korean Air's vaccine cold chain, and then I'll turn it over to Deepak Elias, who will share Broadridge's private investment hub solution, which is a private blockchain investment fund management. To answer the question of why private blockchains are needed, we should probably turn back to why private blockchains were invented back in 2015 in the first place. By then, Bitcoin, and to a certain extent, Ethereum, had already shown the possibilities of what a decentralized immutable ledger, paired with a layer of automation, as well as an embedded financial exchange layer could do. However, as enterprises and government agencies even started trying to use this technology, they ran into four adoption barriers. And the first one was while the open nature of public blockchains made it very attractive for rapid innovation and growth, the same characteristic made it unsuitable for enterprise-grade workloads because these workflows have to operate under security and compliance requirements. As an example, SOC 2 compliance requires that the workflows for an enterprise be protected end-to-end -end behind firewalls, user roles with access, two-factor authentication, you name it. And that certainly doesn't work for a public blockchain. Further, while the decentralized nature of a public blockchain does make it a suitable solution for disaster recovery, again, the lack of privacy controls violates the compliance requirements especially later on when government-driven regulations such as GDPR drove even further regulations which would result in fines that amounted to as much as 4% of a company's annual revenue upon a violation. In addition, as enterprises started experimenting with blockchain, they found that it could not scale for their needs. As a comparison, Visa's payment network processes about 24,000 transactions per second. And at the time, Ethereum, without any of the scaling technologies that are available today, such as the layer two zero knowledge rollups or optimistic rollups, can only process 15 to 20 transactions per second. Finally, enterprises couldn't hold the tokens or the cryptocurrencies that were required to pay for the network utilization, also known as gas. And that's because cryptocurrencies were, and one would say still are, considered emerging asset classes. So the accounting standards around these new asset classes, the legal considerations for holding these type of cryptocurrencies is still fluid. Now, private blockchains, with their restricted permissions and their gasless transactions, allowed enterprises and government agencies to utilize this technology to bring efficiencies to multi-party workflows, especially those where the entities that operate the blockchain have to have equal rights and responsibilities. And that's one of the key drivers for private blockchain implementation. Oftentimes, the supply chain management was uh, trialed upon to use private blockchains. And this industry is used across almost every industry itself, from tracking real-time shipment to fighting counterfeits to even tracking source code utilization. Many times these type of workflows involved multiple parties, fragmented business workflows, siloed databases, and manual processes. So it was no surprise that enterprises tried to bring private blockchain to supply chain management. The financial industry also found private blockchain a very interesting technology. In certain areas, the financial industry is very efficient in settling securities, and I can think of equities as a good example of that. But then in other areas, in the alternative asset classes, such as bonds 
and also the private equity market. Having siloed databases and manual processes is almost just still the norm. I can think back to my many years as a bond portfolio manager. In order to participate in a new corporate issue, I would get my new issue allocations from multiple banks or brokers that were running the deal. I would receive these allocations on my Bloomberg terminal through IM messages. I would get phone calls that would tell me these allocations. And many times, the details wouldn't even match each other. Once I got that difference reconciled, I would then book it into my own silo database, my own portfolio management system. And then I thought I'd be done. Until three days later, my operations department would tell me, John, the details that you entered did not match what the bank actually sent me as the final settlement instructions. Private equity, likewise, has many efficiencies that can be brought. In a survey done by BNY Mellon just this year across 270 financial institutions, the private equity ranked as one of the highest areas that could benefit from private blockchain implementations. And Broadridge's solution later in this session will highlight some of those benefits. Governments also looked at private blockchain as a solution. Initially, they looked at it as a way to digitize credentials. Importantly, they didn't want to just digitize credentials. They wanted to do so in a way that could be shared easily across the different government agencies, across different countries as well. So now, you could have your driver's license, your passport, with information shared real time and accurately across the countries. Recently, it's more attention been turned towards central bank digital currencies, or CBDCs. And they often employ some type of ledger technology, frequently some form of private blockchain. There are now 11 or 10 live CBDCs in the world, and 19 of the 20 G20 countries are already experimenting with CBDCs. So it's actual progress being made. In the last two months alone, the New York Fed, the Bank of Japan, all announced additional CBDC initiatives, this time in partnership with banks. There are many different types of private technologies that can be utilized to build these use cases. Hyperledger Fabric, for example, offers the most flexibility because of its modular framework. And this allows builders to swap in different types of databases and different types of protocols as needed. And one of the most important benefits of Hyperledger Fabric is the ability to create privacy channels between the peers. So you can share data between peers as well as implement logic that only applies between the peers. Hyperledger Besu, on the other hand, offers native compatibility with Ethereum networks. And this makes it ideal for workloads or workflows that later need to be integrated with public blockchains or essentially need to be moved onto a public blockchain completely. You can think of Web3 type of workflows when you think about Hyperledger Besu. R3 is another technology that can be utilized frequently in the insurance and also the financial space. It offers a high transaction throughput network and integration with many of the financial systems that are used for settlement today. And there are many others, like Quorum and Indy. Each one of them have their own value propositions. If you want to learn more about these, Come find us at our AWS Village. Glad to talk more about them. The private blockchain and blockchain in general is still an emerging technology as well. And there are some challenges that you're going to come across as you try to build the applications. The first is it is a kind of high technical barrier. And while the concepts of distributed services and peer-to-peer -peer services themselves alone are not new, it's been done before. The fact that you have to get them operate on a decentralized and immutable single ledger does bring across those complexities. Having to permission nodes that permission the, that control the network, as well as reach consensus when you're deploying new business logic through smart contracts or chain code, all add to the technical barrier. Second, this is more of a human type of problem. It is getting your competitors to join the network that you just created. I mentioned earlier, competitors are trying to operate in a cooperative type of industry. Everyone wants to work together for the benefit of all. Right? However, when some competitor receives an invite to join your network, they may ask the question, why can't you join my network? <laughs> so that often holds back a lot of the private blockchain adoption. And even after you get competitors to join the network, Reaching consensus in maintaining this technology and business logic is also challenging. 
Take, for example, if one of the peers want to introduce a new pricing structure that affects all the other peers, how should that situation be taken care of? While the technology, such as from Hyperledger Fabric, allows for these things to happen, there still is the challenge of human-to-human -human interaction in supporting this network. And all these challenges lead to a long-term investment. This isn't a quick three-month type of prototype and you're done. Usually, from the point of ideation to production rollout, it takes 18 months, and this is well-thought-out planning. However, a well-thought-out private blockchain solution with a clear ramp to onboard new members and builders often brings benefits that outweigh the challenges that you will face. With the innovation that we're seeing in the public market, privacy innovation such as zero knowledge, and also scalability innovation such as layer two, where interactions and transactions can now be increased by thousands to tens of thousands of transactions per second on top of public blockchains, perhaps you get the question whether private blockchains are even needed anymore. And the answer is yes, they are still needed because it still provides the best place for entities who have to operate under this co compliance and regulatory requirements to build that type of cooperative workflow where everyone shares the rights and responsibilities to maintain this network. Furthermore, the network members that operate this network have full control how and when to upgrade this technology. And this is important from a business continu continuity challenge. Take, for example, Ethereum. It changed its consensus from proof of work to proof of stake in September. And that was really good for the entire network because it decreased the energy consumption per transaction by about 99%. However, this switch took place at a time that was not fully in control by the pure, the node operators. Third, private blockchains provide a safe training ground to migrate the existing workflows that you have into a more decentralized type of workflow. And people who have built private blockchain, uh, private applications, know the amount of integration and checks and balances that are in place today. You can't just lift and move it cleanly into a new environment. You have to make sure all the existing integrations still work, they don't break. And private blockchains allow that to happen. Finally, even after you've moved a workflow to production, Private blockchains can still serve as a good training or staging area to make sure that your final compliance requirement checks are met. For example, you may need that the data and values sit within a certain controlled environment for three days. And then after those three days are met, you can let that data flow into the public blockchain through permissioned bridges. Now we've spoken with customers in various stages of their private blockchain and even general blockchain journey. Some are at the stages of ideation, some are supporting full enterprise grade workflows. And we've come across four best practices that will help you maximize the success of building a private blockchain application. First, you have to consider the social scalability, the human aspect of building a blockchain network. That is oftentimes as challenging or even more challenging than the technical side of it. I hinted at this earlier. How do you get peers or competitors to join your network? How do you get additional builders to build on top of the network that you're now supporting? That's social scalability. Second, make sure you model the data that you want to put onto blockchain in a thoughtful fashion. Not all the data points need to be on blockchain because even in a private blockchain, replicating that information across all the peers is expensive. So you want to make sure you have the most secure information, the most reliable information that can be shared across all the peers. Even in a permission network, you have to manage the permissions within that permission network. All the nodes could have different types of permissions. Some can have full read and write with all visibility of all data. Others might just have read-only permissions. And you can imagine the case of an auditor. They have read permission to all the data there. So make sure you consider the permissions Finally, as always in any technology, take baby steps. Whenever we migrate a workflow, it is very tempting to take that incredibly inefficient workflow that you're seeing right now and put it completely onto a blockchain workflow. That brings with it the added challenges of many, many different types of integrations that you have to make sure are still working and even more parties that you have to consider as you're bringing it on. So 
it makes more sense to identify a core area of the workflow and prove the value to the entire network by taking that to production and then slowly expanding the impact or adding more members into your private blockchain network. Customers use AWS and Amazon Managed Blockchain to help build their private blockchain solutions. And one of the benefits that customers have is a lot of their existing workloads actually already exist on AWS, which makes integration a lot easier. For example, customers use AWS core compute services, such as EC2 and the exclusive Nitro systems, to power a lot of their application servers, as well as the nodes that secure the blockchains. They also use AWS's existing storage systems, such as S3 or DynamoDB, and they could be storing access logs and data records of all kinds. AWS also helps accelerate the customer's time to market with services such as API Gateway that make it simpler to create scalable and secure endpoints for the developers. And in the aspects of security, AWS offers services such as KMS, HSM, and also Nitro Enclaves. And these are necessary to secure and encrypt the nodes that then in turn secure the private blockchain itself. AWS also offers a host of big data and analytics tools so that customers can take the on-chain tool, on-chain data, as well as the off-chain data, and merge those into business insights and tr application triggers. AWS continues to tailor these services for blockchain developers. And Amazon Managed Blockchain offers a fully managed private and public blockchain. On the private blockchain front, Amazon Managed Blockchain, or AMB, supports Hyperledger Fabric. On the public blockchain front, AMB supports managed Ethereum nodes. And AMB comes with the full reliability and scalability that AWS is known for, and offers a pay-as-you-go model, which helps keep customers' costs low, both in the terms of ongoing maintenance and as well as uh, the operations cost of a blockchain network. And AMB is integrated with AWS 200 other services, some of which you saw earlier in that slide. In 2022, we released support for Hyperledger Fabric 2.2, which is the latest LTS version for Hyperledger Fabric. We also released support for Hyperledger Fabric on GovCloud. And this is the first time that government agencies or those who have to operate and work with government agencies under the strictest of US requirements can now build blockchain applications on a fully managed solution. Finally, we release token-based access for our public Ethereum node, which makes it easier for distributed apps to plug into the node, as well as makes it easier for test environments to run. Now I'd like to spend a few minutes talking about our customers private blockchain implementation from Korean Air. And when I first saw their supply chain use case, and I saw the vaccine code chain, I thought it was a supply chain that was meant to combat colds, like getting a cold, getting, you know, getting sick. But then after learning about the use case, I understood that a cold chain is actually just a supply chain with the added complexity of keeping the temperature at a low temperature throughout the entire life cycle of that shipment. Now, Korean Air is one of the largest global transporters in the world. And in 2021, they shipped their first vaccine into Korea. And since then, as you can imagine, transporting vaccines has become a very important part of their business. But transporting vaccines is quite challenging. You have to maintain the vaccine at a certain temperature from the point that it is created to the point that it is injected into the patient. And the World Health Organization estimates that up to 50% of vaccines are actually lost in transit because the maximum temperature was violated at some point in time. This information of where the shipment is must then be shared in real time across all the participants. And simplistically, there are three of them here, which are the forwarders or the shippers, the customs offices, as well as the airline itself. And of course, the information must be stored we'll call it forever, because you need to audit this information. To transport these vaccines, Korean Air utilized special unit load devices. And these were outfitted with temperature sensors, which picked up the temperature both inside the unit load device as well as outside. And you would track the shipment as well as the temperature throughout the supply chain. Now, the existing system that Korean Air and its par uh, other parties used relied on a three-layer centralized system. 
the customs, the forwarder, the airline would enter in the, all this information directly into the relay network, the first centralized area. Certain aspects of this information would then be replicated over to a cargo system, and this would feed information over to Korean Air again to say, pick up this latest shipment and drop it off at a certain place. Then the information would be replicated yet once again to a separate database which would power web pages where the parties could go and pick up the information to see where the shipment was. Now while this three layer system worked pretty well when the shipments were low, as the number of vaccine shipments increased, the system struggled. Therefore, Korean Air rebuilt this system using a hyperledger fabric network where all three participants can now share that same source of data in real time. And one of the most important things they did was wrap away all the high blockchain complexity behind easy to use APIs. This makes it easier for new members to come on board and build applications. Korean Air considered three primary things as they were building. First, they had to model their data thoughtfully too. I mentioned this very, very early on in this session. They chose the data that was secure and reliable. Remember, garbage into any system equals garbage out. Second, they chose their members very thoughtfully too. And this addresses social scalability. They needed to pick a member, in this case it was a forwarder, who could participate actively in building this blockchain network, as well as play an important role in the supply chain itself. And finally, they also modeled the data that is stored on the blockchain as well. Hyperledger Fabric comes with a world state record, uh, world state database, and you have to think about what's the best way to store this information so I can easily query the information later as well. So let's dig into that last concept a little bit. Korean Air split the data that they're transporting onto the, on these uh, transactions and storing in a database into three major blocks, the airway bill, the temperature information, and also the acceptance information. And much like a traditional database, they needed a way to link all this data together for quick queries. They chose the airway bill number, which you can think about as an invoice number. To deploy the private blockchain, Korean Air created their AWS account, deployed themselves as the founding node using Amazon Managed Blockchain, then invited the forwarder to join the network. The forwarder created their AWS account, received the invite, created the node, and between the two of them, they created a channel. They could now then deploy chain code or smart contract logic to start pushing new information into this blockchain and notes the blocks could now start getting added to the blockchain. New information could show up into the network and then get wrapped away behind an easy to use application, which they use EC2 and Fargate to build. Importantly, they also added the right authentication to this application using AWS Cognito, as well as API Gateway. Now from a user registration standpoint, the user would first register, either it's a forwarder's user or an airline's user, they needed to register in the application. And then they could submit a transaction to the actual blockchain. Now this transaction gets submitted through a single peer. The other peer would then validate that yes, this transaction came from an authorized peer and was also formatted correctly would sign this transaction and send it back to the original requester. Upon receiving this signed transaction, the original requester could submit the now validated transaction to the order. And the orderer's job in this case is to package the block. And once the block is packaged, it could add it to the chain, which updates the state, and the information is now fed back to all the users. And while this thing is very complicated, the entire process is about two to three seconds because the block processing time in Hyperledger Fabric is around two seconds. What was created is now a single service UI where all participants can pick up this critical information in real time. And Korean Air is thinking their next step is to invite the customs agency as a separate node runner. And they're also looking to expand what this private blockchain can carry, the information on this private blockchain, including passenger service information. And this highlights some of the benefits of private blockchain. Once you build that network, you can build more and more information and bring different type of participants into this shared network. Now I'd like to turn it over to Deepak Elias, who will share Broadwidge's private equity market hub.
Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Deepak Elias. Thank you, John. Um, I run the enterprise architecture team at Broadridge. I'm going to talk a little bit about our story of how we took concepts in the blockchain space out to production with specific environments. Now, as part of the enterprise architecture team, let me tell you a little bit about my, my role and our role in the organization. We report into our chief technology officer, and both him and our chief architect have given the mandate to target intentional and practical architecture with the aim of intentional being specific use cases and practical being implementable architecture and solutions that come out of those use cases. What I'm going to talk to you about today is a little bit around how we started the journey of blockchain, how we took it slow, what I can share with you guys from a standpoint of learnings, the actual use case, which is the, uh, the private equity market hub that we actually released, architecture around it, and then some of the things, the stumblers that, that we actually had to go through so that you guys can learn from it and maybe create better solutions. First, let me introduce Broadridge. Broadridge opens its doors in 1962 um, as a, uh, as a a trading hub for one customer at that point uh, as a brokerage services group within ADP, and we were doing about 300 trades a night for one single customer. Since then, it's become independent. It's a five billion in revenue. It's an independent fintech leader, and we do everything from investment to corporate governance and communications. In communications, we reach about 75% of North America. It's a good chance if you have a paper printed from some financial services company, it comes from one of our print shops. And we've gone from the 300 trades a, a day over to about 9 trillion trades that we do every day on average across fixed income and equities. Here is a little bit more data on Broadridge. We have about 50 years of experience. 11 of the top 15 global investment banks' uh, equities are actually processed through our systems. We operate in over 120 countries, um, and we do a ton of trading and post-trade settlements for fixed income and equities. Now, one of the first things that we had to do when we talk about blockchain was to actually understand when and how to get into it. And in order for us to do that, we had to specifically track what was going on in the, in the industry. John covered this really well. Um, however, I'll, I'll repeat a little bit of what he said. As we looked at what we wanted to do in blockchain, we started identifying when do we actually get in. So you can see a little bit of history here. You know, Bitcoin and blockchain were formally introduced, I guess, in the paper by uh, Satoshi. Uh, at that point, it was primarily experimentation. It was geeks playing around, trying to figure out what to do. But there was some interest. There were some um, uh, uh, spaces out there that were looking at actually using blockchain. So the financial services industry was actually getting in interested at that point. It then went from sort of the initial phase to like early enterprise experimentation. Um, and at this point, people were trying to come together to identify what the issues are and can we actually use it. And very quickly, they stumbled on everything John was talking about. You got privacy issues, you got scalability issues, uh, identity issues, all these things that, that you need to manage in what is effectively should be a regulated process. Uh, at this point, you had uh, Ethereum launching, you had Hyperledger Fabric launching, so there were people coming together to try and launch some of these capabilities, but the work didn't really start till about 2018, and that's when we started a lot of our work as well. The intent here was to focus on specific pilots and prototypes, and it's the first thing I, can, I would offer to you guys. If anybody's getting into blockchain, the one thing we were very specific about is to try and identify it to a specific use case with a timeline. Uh, and I'll talk a little bit more about what I mean by that. There were, however, a lot set of use cases that we started looking at. The ones that were most successful were the ones that were done with customers, with a partner that actually was going to use the chain and get some value from it. The success rate at this point was about 3 to 4% in all the projects that were actually deployed. And that's sort of a, a broader statement around the industry. And 2020 onwards is when things really picked up. At least for us in, in Broadridge, we launched three new products out to market. I'll talk a little bit more about them. One of them will actually see the architecture for and take some learnings from it. There was increased interest in digital assets, um, uh, um, decentralized finance and all these stable coins and everything that actually John was talking about. 
uh, we continue to watch the space. And you know, as I'm sure all of you guys do, because everything that's going on in the news, you can tell it's pretty volatile. So it, it, the, the most important thing is to track it, understand when you want to get into it, experiment, and then target a specific use case. How did we actually get start and started in, in uh, blockchain was to, number one, identify a blockchain center of excellence. And there is no, if there was anything, one thing that I would tell you guys that you should probably do is actually make sure you get some form of a center of excellence or, or a SWAT team or something like that together. Uh, this set of people that we actually based out of India actively participated in the industry. Uh, it, let us, it gave us an opportunity to, to do a lot of proof of concept on initial technology that was coming out. Uh, we actually invested in a lot of uh, blockchain platforms out there, like Digital Asset and Symbion. Um, and we, we have filed and actually got some patents as well. But they were able to take in the next phase, go to uh, targeted pilots. And we chose, going back to what I was saying earlier, we chose targeted uh, applications that had initiatives and timelines associated with it. So for example, we have a product called Shareholder Disclosure Hub. It does the SRD2 requirement, which is out of the EU for uh, uh, the rights directive, the shareholder rights directive, and that had a timeline. It had to get done. And uh, we tied our blockchain capability to that, and, and uh, it's actually currently in production and being used. We also released a private market hub, which I'll talk about in just a second, and also our dis distributed ledger for uh, the repurchase agreement market, the repo market, and that's actually used by a lot of customers today, and it trades close to like 70 billion. As we move forward, we'll continue to invest and look at things like coins, cryptocurrency, wallets, and so on and so forth, but the, the target of using a blockchain center of excellence and, and leveraging that to actually create this innovation journey has been key for us. I'll end on this and then talk a little bit more about the actual uh, use case itself. We've seen a lot of movement from the major banks to, uh, to move to essentially tokenizing securities to create more efficient ways to actually do transaction processing. So there's tremendous in uh, interest here. Everybody's actually trying to get on it. There's a lot of trends that are coming up, such as off-chain uh, processing, layer two capabilities, protocols. Uh, they essentially try to address the issues that we were talking about earlier, such as interoperability between chains. If you actually end up wanting to, do, to go across chains, what do you do? How do you do it safely? How do you manage privacy and how do you scale? And there are lots of new technologies and, and systems that are coming out um, that are actually supporting this. So it's an exciting time to be in the market, but it's also very important to understand what the actual use case is that you're going after. So when we were looking for a use case to actually apply blockchain to, one of the ones that came up was in the private equity space. Um, the fund administration across uh, the, uh, the fund managers, the investors, uh, the audits lawyers, there's multiple sources of data, there's multiple legal and compliance things that have to happen. It's pretty time consuming. It's manual, it's document intensive, it's a lot of check boxes, it's a lot of signatures, and it tends to lead to like fragmented broken processes because we have multiple distributed people applying their own rules, trying to converge on a set of rules that makes sense for everybody else. Uh, and so we thought this would be a good use case for us to actually target. Our intent that we started out with was to go for improved efficiency. Because this, uh, it would end up being a fragmented process, if somebody accepted or, or said they, they weren't going to accept this transaction, that may not have made it out to everybody else, and that causes broken processes. Um, so we wanted to improve the transparency and the accuracy of it, reduce the processing cycle, so we're going from days to hours and um, essentially increase the efficiency. So we came up with the, the private market hub, and the intent here is to essentially build a um, ecosystem that the clients can use. And the, you're talking about fund managers, partners, uh, external systems that might need to do it, such as banks or GL systems, uh, auditors, whoever it may be, that have to come together to actually administer private equity uh, funds themselves. And the intent here is to create a, a compelling offering, and as part of that, we use blockchain, and that's what I'm, I'm gonna talk to you a little bit about today. So here is what the private market hub blockchain architecture looks like. It's pretty high level. You know, underneath this, there is like, we build in scalability across AZs, we have 
full CI/CD pipelines, we have full automation operations, very robust security policies and things like that. But the reason I brought this up is, uh, you know, a blockchain application is no different than any other application, but it has to be architected right. There are a couple of things in here. If you look at the application, it's a typical three-tier app. You've got your web, web layer, you've got your application layer, and then you've got your database layer. But we had to do a few interesting things with it. The Amazon blockchain sits in the application tier, and that's what does most of our processing. We had to actually, uh, uh, some of the requirements we had, one of the requirements we had was to actually make sure our funds were domiciled properly in a particular region, and that's a compliance need for us. So we had to have a stack that was uh, managing the US, and we had to have a stack that was managing um, the UK, um, and essentially separate the actual data between them and create two separate uh, chains themselves. We also had the need that to be domiciled in a particular spot uh, or a particular part of the world, you have to you have your keys to control your data in that particular part of the world. So we actually had, for example, um, in Guernsey out of the UK, our encryption keys were, were held there, and we used that to encrypt the data before we put it into blockchain. So we actually did not use uh, KMS directly. Um, you could do that, but uh, because we had our keys externally and we wanted to maintain that external control, we encrypted the data before it ended up in, in the blockchain itself. So that's how we, we managed to do a little bit of the data locality as well as the, uh, the security around keys. Now, John mentioned uh, running into data and performance issues. We spun up blockchain, we said, all right, let's, let's get it going, let's see, let's see what this thing can do. And the first thing we hit is all these limits on the size of the data and how much we can process through it. You know, everything is done in chunks of blocks and if it takes two seconds for a block to write, then you're waiting two seconds if you haven't have a single, single request. The way our use case was working is we actually would for example, create a particular entity in the database, uh, I'm sorry, in, in the chain, and then we would have to update it, maybe make some changes, because the different fund managers or whoever it is dealing with it are making changes to it. Whenever we did that, we actually, we were updating the entire data structure of this. It was a large, large JSON file, and very quickly we started getting errors saying that you're, you're putting too much data when you're actually returning stuff or, or, or entering stuff. So we had to, re-architect a little bit of that data space by doing uh, essentially an entry ID where we created a, a particular entity in, in the actual chain and then started using UUIDs to identify updates to that. So you now had a chain of UUIDs that could help you track what has happened over time. And that's how we, we took care of that itself. It goes back to what John was talking about, making sure you have to model your data to actually get it right with respect to the limits of blockchain. On the right-hand side, the top right-hand side, we then hit the next issue that we had. Blockchain acts as like a transactional system, if you will, right? So you're, you're looking at a life cycle around what you do with blockchain. If you want to submit a transaction and make sure it's actually committed and the block's written and all of that stuff, and that takes time. We can't have a user wait for that. So if we had to say, go and update something in the blockchain, we didn't want them to wait seconds for it to actually respond. So we had to separate the service that was using it from the actual blockchain itself. And so we created an asynchronous mechanism on the top right-hand side to integrate the, the actual events that were, that were happening. And you can see down at the bottom, that's what it kind of looks like. We ended up using an SQS queue, writing stuff to the queue and the integration service would then pull it off. It would handle the state, so it would actually uh, initiate the transaction, submit the transaction, wait for the response, match it back to what it was supposed to return to which user and then send that, send that response back out. The other piece that, that we had to play around with, you know, if you remember earlier, I talked about the fact that we had to redo our data structure. What does redoing a data structure mean in an immutable system? Now you're talking about, you know, should, do I need to go replay those transactions into a new chain and things like that? So, we, we, uh, what we had to do a little bit is actually start taking snapshots and copies of our data so that we can replay some of the data or create mechanics to update the data with later snapshots of something within the actual chain code. So 
migration backup DR are kind of like lumped together, but they all stem around the fact that we had to create a, a job externally. And luckily, because we had a service that sat between any client going into the, into the blockchain, we could use that to do things like keep a copy of the data, have the ability to replay it if we wanted to. Even if we, change, if we have new chain code and we wanted to test it, we need to be able to have the data so we can identify will it break something if we were, uh, if we were actually pushing it out there. We're continuing to work on um, the DR work with some of this in, in partnership with, with AWS. Uh, I mean, the intent for all, for all intents and purposes, blockchain should be DR fault tolerant. Um, and that's how we're using it. We just have this, this in place to make sure that in case we need to add new members, update any data, anything that we have actually hit that, that would require us to replay some of the data, we do it this way. This is what it looks like essentially at the end of the day, and going back to what John said, creating that API and that integration service was vital for us. This is... Um, uh, creating the queue and, and separating the clients from the actual blockchain capabilities was what gave us the agility to be able to, one, go and change the data, replay the data, and even handle other scenarios. Like if a new member came on and we wanted to add some stuff to that for that particular member or things like that, we could actually do it using this uh, blockchain integration services. So with that, I'd, I'd like to close on some of the learnings just to recap with what you guys are doing. Uh, I'm sorry, what we're doing that you guys can probably learn from. Um, data locality, how you do encryption of your keys, how you encrypt the data in, in the blockchain, where it sits and how it lives across the globe uh, is something that affected us. I would say design that early and understand that early. Being able to understand what does it mean to do cross-region, not just data locality, but just general cross-region stuff. I mean, this is something we're working with AWS on and we continue to plan for it. Um, but it is work in progress, something to, to watch out for. Synchronization of nodes as, as you add members, how long does it take, what happens, what changes. Uh, th these are areas that uh, we're still looking at and we're continuing to improve, but these are areas that, that, that we've found that we have to be a little bit more careful about. They take some time and sometimes there's, there's some breakages there. Creating it uh, as an API first uh, solution was key for us. Highly recommend it. Um, everything needs to be an API so that we can actually change and manage what it is that we're trying to do with, with the system itself. And then the notion of a blockchain center of excellence. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, this allowed us to do a lot of different things, that uh, everything from tracking what was happening, happening in the industry to creating the partnerships, uh, creating the delivery mechanics, and actually doing POCs for us to get to our end state. With that, I'll, I'll thank you and maybe open it up for questions if you guys have any.